Hello, everybody. Welcome to this very important topic on how the construction industry can reach the climate target in the Paris Agreement. My name is Harald Nikolaisen, and I'm the CEO of Statsbyg, which is the building commissioner and agency in Norway. I'll just give a very short introduction on the theme before I guide you through this session of very interesting speeches. According to the statistics, the official statistics, the construction and property sector is responsible for approximately 4% of the CO2 equivalent that Norway emits. This seems perhaps not dramatically large. Other sectors such as transport emit much more. The problem is that this 4% comprises only direct emission from existing buildings. The indirect emissions that our sector causes and much more important can do something about are much larger. It comes from extraction of materials, production and transport of building materials and also from the transportation needs that the buildings generate every day through its lifetime. So the entire emission from the construction and property sector contributes to just as much emissions as from road traffic, for instance, approximately 19%. So the construction industry can in fact reduce both our own emissions as well as emissions from other sectors. The EU has estimated that the European construction industry could affect as much as a third of the global greenhouse gas emission. And I think this insight is needed and very important to put the right incentives and the right actions in place for our businesses. Statsbix takes an active position in developing a more climate-friendly buildings. We are testing new technologies, new couplings between known technologies and new manners of using the buildings. We built our first zero emission building in 2017 at the Evenstad campus. It's built in solid timber, local renewable energy, production based on sun and forest, and that compensates for all emission that the building has generated through construction and its lifetime. And now we are going from looking at one building to a complex of building, trying to achieve a zero emission ambition for an entire neighborhood. So, well then, what must the construction industry do in order to meet the Paris climate target? We know this is a very pre pressing matter, and some of the answers I'm sure we'll hear more about in this session. For once, we need forward-looking actors who dare to make contributions, shoulder the risk, and create changes in the market. And I know for sure we'll meet some of them here very, very soon. We also need authorities who pose requirements in the regulation for overall greenhouse ga gas calculation for both new buildings and refurbishing of existing buildings. There is a, there is a gap, there's a huge gap. Maybe someone would say there is a divide between the existing requirements and the Paris targets in the Paris deal at present. We also need to challenge the environmental certification systems so that we are able to measure if we are doing the right things. Today, even the best buildings are far from the Paris climate target. And measures that reduce emission quickly must be prioritized. For example, choices on building materials circular economy and location of new buildings and of course also emission-free construction sites. Now Zero and Statsbyg invites both international and national speakers to debate the way in which construction industry can reach the Paris targets. And we will, I think we are so lucky, that will we hear from four front runners, really, four different um, teams that are lifting the bar 
and they are pushing the limits. And I have the pressure of introducing our first three speakers from the Powerhouse Alliance. Odbjorn Dahlstrom is an energy and envi environmental advisor at Asplan Viak. Tobin Rist and Henning Fjellheim are advisors in Skanska, specializing in the sustainability of products and materials. All have experience from working in depth with life cycle assessment in a number of construction projects with high environmental ambitions. Powerhouse projects and others. I'm very pleased to introduce them. Give them a big hand of applause. The stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Tobin, Oldburn, and myself are very happy to be here today. We have been working on a framework for how to understand why uh, or how plus energy buildings are performing in relation to the Paris uh, goals. You might be wondering why there are three of us on stage, and that's because you need two friends to pull you back out of the data jungle after you've gotten lost. <laughs> so we'll try to make sense of it all for you. Uh, we'll start by introducing the framework and then uh, going into how we're actually doing today, and then presenting some ideas for the future. So uh, the Powerhouse Alliance is a strategic partnership for uh, designing and creating plus energy buildings. But is energy old news? The short answer is no. Uh, we need uh, plus energy buildings to free up energy to uh, transform us from today's society into the zero emission future. By, for example, being able to decarbonize uh, transport, uh, but also, for example, balancing the grid uh, while introducing renewables in Europe. But we are interested in how the plus energy buildings are performing related to the, the Paris goals. Power, the Paris Alliance was formed in 2010. As you all know, in 2016, the Paris Agreement was signed, which stated that we should maximize or uh, the global uh, warming should be limited to two degrees, uh, preferably 1.5. Just recently, IPCC uh, released a report saying uh, that there will be severe consequences of overshooting the 1.5 target. Uh, but at the same time, they presented us with a way out of the misery uh, by showing us the reduction we need to have in order to meet the goals in 2100. So the graph here uh, shows us that uh, if you say that the uh, emissions were 100% in 2010, they show us the uh, reduction in percent of that year uh, for each year until 2100. So in the case, if you take the case of an office building, uh, we have looked at the total carbon emissions from energy consumption uh, in Norwegian office buildings in 2010. And we've created the budget for each year until 2100 by linking it to the curve from IPCC. But energy, energy is not everything. You also have emissions from uh, uh, production of materials, uh, transportation, construction processes, uh, replacement during lifetime, and also end of life processes. So you need to add these two on top of the energy uh, emissions uh, in ratio with uh, the new build and refurbishment for that year. And then now you have the total carbon life cycle balance for a building being constructed, the average office building being constructed in 2010. And now you can extrapolate this into 2100 for each year. You get a total carbon life cycle budget for an office building. So with this in mind, how are we doing? Are we on track? That's a good question. Um, Henning showed us the climate uh, gas budget for uh, the building sector for every year from today and up to 2100. And I will present some results for the building industry, how we are in that line. Uh, the IPCC and the Paris Agreement are using 2010 as the starting point. 
So we will be using that as a reference in the calculations. If you see on the graph the gray line, that's the budget Henning showed us, the climate budget for every year from 2010 up to 2100. And the graph is declining rapidly from 2020 up to 2040. This means in, uh, and the line is crossing zero in the year of 2045. This means that in the year 2045, the building industry should be carbon positive. We have some more years until 2045, but still the time is running fast, so we must do actions now to be on the reduction. The orange line is uh, how the building industry is according to the IPCC uh, trend line. And as we can see from today up to 2020, we are currently on track. And that's good news, a great news for the building industry, at least up till today. After 2000, and the reason why the orange graph is online is mainly because of two elements. Uh, one element is energy. New buildings are using less energy. We have regulations, we have passive houses and plus houses. We refurbish old houses to use less energy, and we are producing energy with uh, lower carbon impacts. So, uh, and the second element of the reduction is uh, material use. We are using the build, the produce, producers of building materials are making better materials with lower carbon intensity. So the sum of materials and energy, the re reduction, uh, does that we are on track so far. And if you see the new brown line, uh, this is uh, the share of the orange line with the materials and energy. Materials is uh, under the line and uh, energy is over the line. So after around the year 2020, the share of energy in the total carbon budget is much lower than the material share. So in the future, the focus should be more on how we use materials and use low carbon materials in the building to be more on track. What can we do uh, in the future? Uh, as I said, we are currently online with the Paris Agreement up to 2020, but after 2020, the orange line is uh, not on track with the gray uh, carbon budget. This, is mainly, um, this means that we need to build different in the future, and actually the buildings we are planning today are maybe ready to be used in two or three years. So if we plan wrong today, we will be outside the graph in a few years. So it's important to start to change now, even though we are on track according to the calculations. You might see some small dots. I'm sorry for the uh, bad uh, visibility, but uh, the green dot on the top on the orange line is carbon life cycle carbon emissions from a new energy positive building. And the blue dot is carbon emissions from a rehab energy positive building. And as you can see, the green dot, the new energy positive building with low carbon materials, is right on track on the budget for that year. And the blue dot is the rehab building. It's uh, around 10% uh, lower than the new building. The reason for the two dots not being, uh, being so close to the orange uh, building industry line is uh, partly because of the materials used in the buildings. Uh, you have um, much solar panels in the, when the buildings are new, and you replace the solar, solar panels after 30 years. And producing solar panels has an impact that is increasing the total uh, life cycle and energy uh, impacts of these powerhouse buildings. So, in the, to sum up, in the future, after 2020, it's not only enough to put solar, solar panels on the building to be in line with the Paris Agreement. We need to do something more to be on track in the future. And Tobin will help us answering that. Thank you. Yes, what do we do when we run out of all the options of reducing energy use and putting solar panels on our buildings because they only replace clean energy from the grid? Um, these are serious challenges, and I think it takes a drastic change to how we think about building materials and how we think about building. 
uh, the Powerhouse Alliance is thinking, trying to think outside the box, trying to think of how we can build fundamentally different buildings that don't view materials as a one-time use uh, asset. That we, we think of a structure of a building, for example, as over multiple lifespans of buildings, that we can disassemble it and that we can use it again. Um, this has been discussed in the past in the building industry, but it's never been implemented in practice. And I think these challenges and these uh, reductions in emissions that we're facing today mean that we have to take it seriously. And so uh, part of that is also focusing on what materials we use and when do emissions arrive, uh, when are they emitted. So this is a picture of a mass timber building. It's, uh, it's elements, you know, so you can disassemble it afterwards but also it's bio-based materials, which means that these materials are not emitting their, their, they, their, the vast majority of their emissions come at the end of the building's life cycle. That means that if we can avoid burning these emissions, as, or burning the materials as we do today, then we haven't even emitted what we assume in the calculations today. So that's a huge drop. And so we've looked at an office building that, for example, is built with a circular economy in mind, designed for disassembly with a bio-based structure, and this is the same figure that Aubyn was showing us with the new building that's plus energy already with low carbon materials and a refurb uh, building that is also plus energy. And this new point shows us where a circular economy building, uh, office building, with de uh, disassembly as, a, as an option for the bio-based structure can reduce emissions with 20% from an already good building. Um, another question we have to ask ourselves is why do we build? I think uh, at the Powerhouse Alliance, we're, we're thinking, OK, so right now we measure energy efficiency per square meter. Why do we do that? When really the function of a building is for the people who use that building. And so we want to build buildings that we maximize the use of the area. We don't want to emit per square meter. We want to emit per person hour. And so we want to measure that and we want to optimize that because then when you have a, an office building, for example, that say 30% of it can be used for uh, tra uh, travelers who, business travelers who need a place to sleep. Well, then all of a sudden you've built 30% less area of a hotel. And so it's a creative way to, uh, to make more use of our buildings that, st that stand empty in the middle of the evening or aren't used on the weekends. Um, how do we do this? I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of design, uh, where architects are involved to figure out how do we fi uh, build in, a, in an era where multifunctions are necessary. Uh, it's also IT. It's how do we create an Airbnb for office buildings, for other uses where you can book on demand an office space because your company doesn't need a building. They just book spare, spare office space and during, when they need it on demand. Um, and so we've, we've taken a look at this in, in terms of what it could do for an office building if, for example, we take the 30% reduction or 30% of the space that could be used for uh, business travelers. And it can have a new, huge impact because you're basically building one building that used, used to be two. And so these are the sort of out of the box ideas that we're thinking of beyond just low carbon materials. It's how do you avoid emissions from the very start. Um, Henning asked in the beginning if energy is old news. It might be getting to be old news because it's a solution that we've, <coughs> we've pushed as far as we can push it, but it's still critical to the, to the entire equation. Um, I think the, when we move forward, though, we have to think more about materials, more about circular economy, more about, OK, this is a building that maybe we'll use it for 60 years, but the materials that we put in this building need to be able to be used after that. And then also maximizing the use of our spaces. They should never be empty for 50% of the time or 50% of the day. They should be used to their full capacity. Uh, powerhouse as an alliance, we're looking forward to building Paris-proof buildings uh, that meet the targets of the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I think your analysis shows that um, the construction industry has to work hard to achieve the goals ahead of us. 
When uh, do you think we need to start planning for this? <laughs> I think the answer is today. Um, as Abjorn mentioned, uh, you know, the, pro the projects that we're planning today are the ones that are, uh, are going to be off track in the future in the figure that we showed. So it doesn't matter that we, it looks like we're on track today. It's actually those meetings that you're in today uh, designing and thinking about the buildings you're going to build, those are the ones that are going to not be on track. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And give Thank them you. a big hand of applause. So I have the pleasure of introducing our next guest. Ole Grassmann is an architect and partner in the well-known company Baumschlager Eleba Architects. The company has offices, 10 different offices, spread around Europe and Asia. And sustainability is central core to their business. And we are really looking forward to a presentation of two very interesting projects. The stage is yours. For the invitation, time is precious not only in that conference, and it's a big resource, so I have to speak it up and not to spoil too many empty phrases. Um, at the moment, we are all looking for answers. And what we feel is that we are looking for simple answers. And the question is, is that really the good track we are on it? And we think, are we also doing the right, answer, uh, the right questions? And is it as simple to change from diesel to e-car that we think that we can solve problems? We think we should be a little bit suspicious about it. And we think, let's face the complexity. I hope now you can see, not yet, but now, I will talk about the, a project where we are also integrated in. It's the Landbruchsquartalet in Oslo. And unfortunately, I cannot really point out the area we are also working on. But that's the interesting thing. It's in the heart of the city. And the, this project for us, and not also for us, but for the developers, for the transporter studio, what the master plan means, that we're trying to, to understand the city as a chance. And the project itself, it's located very close to the main station and integrate it into the existing structures. I will go now and show you where it is, because it's not easy to, to find. It's located up there, where, where my pointer is. So what does that mean to us? It's close to the city, and what does it mean too? It means it's a big, big resource because building land is also something we should understand as a resource. There are existing structures, there is diversity, and there are powerful buildings, and our understanding is we should take this opportunity to develop it and to develop it further. As the city of Oslo is already growing right now, we think we should take this opportunity and support this and to make a good and intensive and vibrant quarter out of it. That's what we see. And when we approach to such a project, we first try to understand the problems. And then we try to get into a design. So what we try to do with our contribution to the project, we want to activate the given structure. And we understand the building land as a big resource. The next one is not an image. It's what we say, what do we need for in the future? And what can we learn from the past if we enter in such developments? And uh, as you can see here, there are several points which need to be mentioned and which need to be treated if we do developments. The big thing what is in there in this strategy, it's not the strategy itself, it's only the different factors which we have to, to look on. It's about environment. And environment means as well climate, but also tradition. And if we talk about densification, about densifying quarters, it means not only that we try to get more square meters, it also means that we need to get new relations to build areas, 
and that we need also to create public spaces. And in this discussion, preservation of existing buildings is one factor, but it's not the only one. We have to understand that all the developments we are doing and which we will do in the future are have different factors and we have to investigate them all at the same time and we don't have to focus only on one and to tell people that this is the solution. For example, for the individual well-being, we need to, to face the fact that there is a certain wish and desire for comfort and also for social relationships. And if we are talking about sustainability in our office, it's not about energy. It's also about economy and it's also about social relationships because all, if you put all these together, then you will get a real sustainable project. If we are not facing all these factors at the same time, we will fail. We also have to see the social developments which are mentioned uh, on one of these points when we have to look on resource efficiency. But when we enter into the building factors, we also have to look how can we make buildings work better for the future. So we have to get rid of monofunctional buildings and we know we have to invent buildings which bear better the future needs. But now I will flip over to the, to the Landbrooks Quartalet in, in a particular or in a more particular way, even if I only show one image of it. But the intention of the, the, the design from the Landbruchswag Quartalet and, and its, uh, its master plan is the idea how to create public space, how to integrate it into the city, and how can we turn density into quality. And that is one of the very, very important things to understand. We cannot only say we want nothing to be changed, we want only to preserve, we need also to develop and to, to turn it into something new. And that's something we think which was a very great success from the master plan from Transporter Studio. Because what you can see in the center of this image is a place and the place is the consisting element for the city, the urban space, the public space. And that's the very important thing we need to understand. It's not about the building objects which are doing the life in a city. We need the place that relations can be built up and that's the very important thing. We are looking for the relations and the integration into the ensemble, into the existing grid of the urban structures. That's something which is perfectly given within that project. Also, the tension, the interesting dialogue between old and new, which you can see on the top left, where you can see a little bit the dialogue, which is a project which is done in Cologne from Peter Zumthor, but which reflects very well the idea that old and new come together and create something interesting, something new, something exciting, but not as a confrontation, but as a giving hand. That's, that's the, 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 the big thing about it. And also that the idea of the Landbrooks Quartalet master plan is not to make an isolated island, but to make as much as possible connections to the, to the environment. I'm going now to the next point. We only did one building, or we, we are trying to do one building within that, uh, that, uh, that parameter, which is a, is, a, uh, is a house made out of wood, because we want in that project to make something which tries to reduce the carbon footprint as much as possible. And we are doing a high-rise, or we are pro proposing a high-rise building with a double-layered facade, so to protecting the interior structure. It should be a flexible, open building, which integrates different functions, from commercial areas, kindergartens, housing, and offices. Everything is possible within it, and within all the same structure. And we also can show, we have already some experience in doing so, and we invited also other specialists to, to follow us on this way. But to go on, what is our approach for future buildings? We developed in the past uh, a building project which is named 2226, and this name reflects the idea to get a building which guarantees you uh, a comfort, in the, an internal comfort from 22 to 26 degrees. What is the idea behind? Less technology, 
less, less, let's say, less hardware, but better management, better software, and the, to guarantee the same comfort. This building is running now for three years. We have no ventilation, no heating, no cooling, no structure of that at all. And what does it mean also? It means that we are creating with that building an economic perspective, at the same time an ecological perspective. And that's the very important thing. I know people will say, that's very nice, that works in Austria, that works in nice areas. It's not the truth. It also works now in Zurich. We will do in the next one in Berlin, and it will spread all over. Uh, what you can see here is the energy consumption of the building. And the real interesting thing about it is that the, the consumption is dropping down remarkably because there is no en energy input from outside. We don't need to burn anything. And we also didn't integrate at the moment uh, solar gains or anything like that. It it's, has no technology, the building. It has technology, but not the one we are used to, to do in, in buildings normally. So that's the interesting thing in it. Next thing, I have to speed up, it's about the life cycle costs. We have to stop only to focus that is energy an issue and how the building runs and how much energy it needs. We have also to face the fact how it is built, what will be done if it will be removed, how much energy is put into the materials we will need to build the project. So the life cycle costs is one thing with gray energy, which is very often not investigated. And the second thing, how much maintenance does it need? And this building needs a lot of m less maintenance first, second, less investment costs. And that's the very interesting thing about it. So, conclusion, face the complexity, use the things you have, and try to create a dialogue instead to find simple answers. What we try with this project and also with the project we are providing here for Oslo, make the things work, but work on it seriously. So far, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ole Grossmann, for this interesting, very short lecture. So, um, and I think it's very impressive to see what you've done with your pro projects. Of course, this requires a lot of knowledge to make these kind of buildings. What do you think? Are we on the right track? What do we need to focus? Do we have the right focus to reach these ambitious goals? We think that at the moment, um the issue of energy is, is a very tough thing, and it's mostly in the focus. But we, we have a little bit suspicious about it because we think we need, as I showed in, in my previous uh, slides, we need to look more on the complexity, and we need a more holistic approach. Energy is one extremely important thing, but it's not, not, not the only one. And we have to really to check the things in a much more reasonable way and in a much more serious way. And if we think we can replace it through, let's say, balanced ventilation or other premises, we don't believe in that. We think we need a much more serious and much more holistic approach to answer first the questions, but to invent and to, in, and to understand the questions, the real questions. And we think we are not yet there. Thank you very much. We look forward to see a number of your new projects where you can work on further solutions to this complex question. Thanks a lot. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. We move on to our next presentation, Gabriella Costa is a senior sustainable consultant and is the main coordinator of passive and environmental design at Sveco UK. Her expertise relates to indoor environmental control, occupant well-being and passive design. She has also undertaken thermal modeling for the Bloomberg building and have closed relationship with their philanthropist department to promote sustainable design and engineering careers to young college students in London. And now we really look forward to hearing about this spectacular building.
thanks for the invitation and coming here and present to you the Bloomberg headquarters in London. Michael Bloomberg's vision and aspiration for this building was to push the boundaries of sustainable design and create a place that excites and inspires their employees. So I'm hoping to inspire and, ex and make you excited today presenting this project. So Bloomberg is located in the heart of the city of London, very close to St. Paul's Cathedral and to the north of the River Thames, indicated in yellow in this image. It is the highest rated uh, sustainable office building in the world. It achieved the BREEAM outstanding rating of 99.1% out of 110% available credits. Its location has some very interesting uh, features from the Roman times when London was just a small village. Uh, the architects have designed a building that not only takes into consideration that, that historical context, but gives back to the community some aspects of that Roman context, like a Roman road and the relocation of the Temple of Mitras to the, their original spot. Today you can go there and visit the temple. It's, uh, it's free to visit, I believe. So Sweco was appointed by Michael Bloomberg to carry out the building services engineering design, uh, sustainability consultant, BREEAM certification, and commissioning. The aim of the of this project was to be um, a building design for more than 100 years. So the goal was to be adaptable, flexible, and generous a generous space to its employees. At Sweco, during concept design stage, we came up with a competition internally to get, gather in ideas from uh, our employees. And we got to a total of 40 innovations that I'm going to talk to you about four of the key ones today. The first one is regarding the facade. And this is a work of art from the architects mainly and from our input on advising the, the design on energy efficiency and optimization. So the building has, it's trying to maximize the glazed area, but at the same time controlling solar gains by designing those bronze fins uh, to the facade. And they are carefully designed so that its angle is used to shade the glazed panels, so the windows behind. And those fins, they also have openings on the sides that allows natural ventilation into the space during mid-season, so this time of the year and spring when the air uh, temperature is not that great. You can allow fresh air into the space, reducing the need for cooling, and this is going to go up to the atrium uh, on the rooftop. Another interesting feature is that this is the first office building in the UK to have dr vacuum drainage incorporated. So this design was only possible due to pushing the boundaries of innovation and from the industry on vacuum drainage. So if you think about vacuum toilets as those that you can find on airplanes, this would be equivalent to a, a Nopal Corsa type of car, where, whereas in Bloomberg, in the Bloomberg building, the technology is so much more advanced that it would be equivalent to a new Tesla car. <laughs> and another important feature is that this type of uh, vacuum drainage, sorry, I think there's something wrong there, um, it saves us 100%, 100% no, sorry, 80% of um, water use compared to a st traditional system. It, um, it also uses rainwater, grey water, and water from, recycled from the cooling towers to flush the toilets. So there is zero potable water used for flushing those toilets. And that is really, really important in London because the supply versus demand of water is, is going up. The shortages of uh, water and the shortfall of demand versus supply as you can see on the graph. So we save approximately 10 Olympic swimming pools per year of volume of water in, compar in comparison to other buildings. 
Another interesting feature is the integrated ceiling panels. This has been designed by Sueco in collaboration with the architects, Foster and Partners, and the acousticians. So it's a, it's a panel that incorporates um, cooling, lighting, acoustics, sprinklers, and detectors. It's a panel that can be hinged so you can access uh, the top of the panel if necessary without uh, wasting materials. And you can replace it as well. The fact that we have LED lighting together with a cooling type of chilled ceiling uh, makes the lifetime of the LED lights uh, longer, so it saves more energy and the building will, uh, the, the materials will last for longer. Lastly, I'm going to talk to you about the trade generation uh, system to generate energy on site. We have a combined heat and power unit, which is basically a gas engine type, but the size of that gas, gas engine is equivalent to the, that one shown in, in the slide in red. It's like a railway locomotive, and we have three of them on the basement of Bloomberg Building. So we use natural gas to fit into this gas uh, engine, and it burns the gas so it would deliver simultaneously electricity and heating, but it generates so much waste heat that we can harvest that waste heat and push it to the absorption chiller so we provide cooling as well. So we have space heating, uh, cooling, and domestic hot water uh, from this system. That's why it's a tree generation. And the carbon savings associated to this type of on-site on uh, electricity and, and heat generation is, around, uh, is, is equivalent to traveling the world by car 120 times per year. But lastly, um, at the stage of the tree generation, we still don't, we're not carbon neutral. So as a corporate responsibility and a personal initiative from Bloomberg was to ask us to size the amount of solar panels they will need to completely offset their carbon emissions to, uh, associated to electricity. So Michael Bloomberg has bought uh, three solar farms in the UK to invest into renewable energy generation back into the UK grid, thus lowering the, envir the environmental footprint of the building. So in essence, this building is, is zero carbon. This is just a list of a few awards we've, we have won. Um, just the Riba Sterling Award has been a major uh, achievement for this building. And there are many others. This list is just getting bigger. And I will just leave you with an image of the internals so you can see more or less how it would be to work in this building. It's giving back to its employees um, space, thinking about their well-being, and bringing back the historical context to, to the site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Very inspiring to get a glimpse of this fabulous project in the center of London. Mm -hmm. And with also this, it seems like a lot of innovation, also technically. Is there any tricks of the trade for, for, for your processes to get these innovations that, we, that the rest of us could learn from, do you think? I think it was a lot of the engagement with the team. So having everyone designing and on the same page about what they need to do and with the same aim. So it, it was really good to sparkle uh, insights and, and drive innovation. So even for people outside the, the design team, like the industry in general, the contractors, they, they had a very challenging task to to think a bit out of the box mm. and try and create something new. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. The last speaker of this uh, session is Ben Kubinga, and he works for Circle Economy in Amsterdam. This is a social enterprise that accelerates the transition to circularity through the development of practical and scalable solutions. He leads the Built Environment Program. 
Give Ben Kibinka a great round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're still alive. Uh, welcome, indeed, to this presentation. My name is Ben Kubinga, work for Circle Economy. Um, our mission is to accelerate the transition to the circular economy through practical and scalable solutions. The reason that I'm here today is uh, thanks to Circular Norway, who invited me. They are part of our uh, network of sister organizations that help us scale the solutions that we develop. And what I would like to show you today is um, a practical examples of how the circular economy can help bridge the gap that we're facing um, in terms of the climate challenge that we have. Uh, part of it can be mitigated through the agreements that we have at the national level, but there is a remaining gap, and we believe at Circle Economy that we can bridge this gap by applying circular strategies worldwide. And the built environment, of course, is a key sector to do so. The example I would like to use is not, I guess, a coincidence, uh, the building called Circle, uh, which is the pavilion that ABN AMRO built uh, in Amsterdam in the business district in the south. ABN AMRO is one of the three big banks in the Netherlands. And they decided to change a project that was already halfway uh, going on uh, from a three-star uh, restaurants for rich bankers in, the, in this district to a more soci social project um, based on circular principles. Uh, and this is the building that they've created. Uh, it's in the middle of uh, these large towers and they're a World Trade Center. And I will show you based on the seven elements that we use as Circle Economy for the circular strategies, how they have applied this uh, in real life. These seven elements we apply in all our work. Um, the three on the left relate to material uh, strategies, so using regenerative resources, uh, preserving and extending what's already made, and at the end, when nothing can be looped anymore in the inner circles, then use waste as a resource. And the last four on the right are those that enable the transition. So you, looking at new business models, product service systems, looking at new forms of design, uh, not only at the product level, but also at the, the systems level to make sure that if a product is designed, it also comes back in the end to the producer or those who actually can keep the value and restore it. An important element is also digital technologies that facilitate the transition. Think of material passports. Perhaps blockchain will play a big role in tracking transactions that take place. Um, and lastly, uh, but definitely not the least important, is collaboration. This is a key element that needs to happen. We need to bring the entire value chain together to come up with these solutions, because as a single player, as an architect, you cannot predict what, at the end of the chain, demolishers, harvesters will, in the end, be able to do to keep the value that is put into a building. This is. The first example I want to show from Circle, the pavilion in Amsterdam. This is the floor uh, in the building made out of uh, reused wood from uh, a demolition project. Uh, they also, besides using wood, they also used uh, genes of their employees to really get the commitment and the involvement uh, of the employees um, in the construction and in telling the story around this building, because that's the the key thing, I think, uh, what brings the value to this uh, building is that they have thousands and thousands of visitors every month visiting this building and using the spaces that this creates. Now, looking at the broader picture uh, of using waste as a resource, this is extremely important in countries like Norway, like the Netherlands, where I come from, and uh, Western countries, because we have so much in our stock already that we need to reuse. So we don't need to mine elsewhere, we just need to mine the urban mine. The second example is about a product service system. This is um, not the pavilion that you see here, but it is the elevator of Mitsubishi that they use. And what they do is they actually buy per vertical movement. That's it. They don't buy the elevator, but every time the elevator is used, they pay 
a fee. This is a nice way that you can apply to lighting. Philips is doing that, and others uh, in the meantime as well, and to many other rather complex technical products that you can easily uh, develop into a high quality that it lasts longer. And if you have a product service system, then you ensure that the producer who keeps the ownership uh, is incentivized to develop a high quality product. Uh, and this is both relevant in our economies, but also in emerging economies, and can help in bridging the gap uh, and save carbon emissions, because we need less of these uh, machines to be built. The third example is about lifetime extension. Uh, the example you see here is the, um, the blocks with um, phase changing materials in it and that allow for buffering the temperature. So there's no heating system, there are simply uh, these layers in the ceilings that keep the temperature. When it gets colder, it releases warm air or releases heat from these uh, elements and the other way around uh, as well. And lifetime extension um, is important. These are designed to last uh, as long as the building lifetime. And lifetime extension is relevant again here in Norway and in Western countries because we need to keep the stock that we have. And it's uh, equally relevant in terms of the design of new buildings, for instance, in China or in India, where we have to make sure that they don't last 30 years like they tend to do, but they last 50 or 100 years and on top of that are ready for disassembly as well. The next example is more about sharing platforms, also rethinking the business model. Um, and this example is from the building itself, where they offer shared spaces. Uh, li like I said, you can use the space, you can rent the spaces, but you can also, they have uh, a close collaboration with the neighborhoods, uh, where they invite them to use the spaces also after office hours. So it has multiple functions. Uh, and again, sharing the assets that you have can reduce the amount of assets that you need to produce and thus reduce the emissions associated with it. Then lastly, an example regarding the wood that was used. I saw it coming back in the previous present or one of the previous presentations as well. It has multiple benefits. This is Larix wood uh, used for the superstructure of the building, locally sourced in the Netherlands. Um, it embodies, it captures carbon, it avoids emissions from cement and uh, other structural elements that would otherwise be needed. Uh, what they did on top of that, they designed it in such a way that it can hold, it has the carrying capacity for this building, but it's actually a little bit stronger because they made the beams uh, slightly thicker so that at the end of use of this building, they can scrape off the used sides of the beams dismantle the, or first dismantle the whole thing because it's fit for disassembly, scrape off these sides and reuse it in another building. So a combination of multiple circular elements. What I would like to finish with is this slightly complicated overview because um, what we did with uh, these circular building strategies, we, together with uh, our partners, the Dutch Green Building Council, SDS Search and Metabolic, we looked at what our overall circular building strategies that we need to apply. We developed this general framework, and then based on that, we looked at BREEAM, the circular, not the circular, the sustainable building standard, to see where the gaps are. And what you see here is in light colors at the top, for instance, regarding materials, where the biggest gaps are. There's a lot of improvements regarding circularity to be made. Think of material passports, think of design for disassembly. And at the bottom, you see that water actually has already been addressed quite well. So this is a good example of uh, a scalable solution, because the moment one of these indicators gets introduced into BREEAM, the impact worldwide can be large. And on top of that, it will help uh, reducing uh, the emissions gap that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. I see it's time to roll up our sleeves now and start working. It is. Yes, right. Um, we are very interested in how the circle economy will affect construction industry in Europe and also in Norway. What do you think is the greatest potential for, for triggering reuse of construction material? 
I think there's a great potential, and I learned over the past two days that there's uh, already, um, I guess the scene has already been set if you look in, in, in Norway and in Oslo, because what you already have created is places to store uh, materials that can be reused from demolition projects. And that's something that in the Netherlands we only started doing very recently. So maybe this is a small encouragement here as well that you are already on the right track in terms of reusing materials. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. And then on this uh, slightly optimistic tune, we, we end this session. I'd like to thank all the speakers, of course, and of course you in the audience. And just one reminder on your way home, do you know what is the most environmental friendly square, meeting, square meter of buildings in Norway and in the world? The one we don't build. And knowing that 40 to 50 percent of all square meters office space in Europe is vacant at every peak hour, this is also something to take with us back home. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>